The creed is then just simply confessed. The people are still standing. The only ceremonies in the creed, really, are genuflecting or bowing at the incarnatus. So there's been a little bit of confusion in our circles about this. I think this mainly comes from an anecdote that Luther tells uh, where he says that even the devil would genuflect at the homo factus est. So what's wrong with you sluggards in Wittenberg that you don't appreciate this thing? Well, Luther is using this phrase, homo factus est, the Latin for and was made man, as shorthand for, for this part of the liturgy where, where the genuflection takes place. So uh, it doesn't mean that you only genuflect for that part of it. Uh, in, the, in, in the dominant tradition and custom of the church, we genuflect from and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. And genuflecting, of course, again is going down and simply taking one knee, and it's appropriate and fine to use the altar for balance here, and then to stand back up at the end of the phrase. So we are standing back up for and was crucified under Pontius Pilate. And this is a significant ceremony because genuflection is not uh, a res- it's, it's not embodying the Lord's humiliation, which some people have gotten that idea, but rather it is a response of humility and joy on our part to the incarnation. So we are responding to this greatest mystery. The greatest mysteries in the church of our faith are the incarnation that God became flesh for us and the Holy Trinity. And these things, of course, completely tied to justification and the atonement. But the, uh, we genuflect there in, in humility before the mystery, even as we bow our heads at the name of the Trinity, that, that sort of thing. So we stand for and was crucified under Pontius Pilate because we are unashamed of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And because under uh, Herod and Pilate both, men once mocked our Lord uh, with the crucifixion as though he were king. And so we, we don't want to be part of that. So we stand up. We, uh, in our case, we have a crucifix, so it's just perfect for this. And uh, we are sort of bold to look at the cross and, and, and to think on the, the goodness of God who gave himself in death by crucifixion for us. Uh, so we are genuflecting again in adoration for what God has done in becoming a man. And we're standing up in joy, unashamed of the cross of Jesus Christ. The only other ceremony in the creed then uh, is at the very end that we make the sign of the cross uh, at the last phrase, life of the world to come, uh, recognizing again that it's by the cross that we have eternal life and that in this way God has won the forgiveness of sins for us. So also then kind of mirroring the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer with the summary petition, deliver us from evil. From there, the liturgy moves into the hymn of the day uh, and then the sermon. There's not much really to say about ceremonies with the sermon, except that it is most ideal if the sermon is actually preached from a pulpit so that we have this architectural anchoring of the preaching of the word. uh, And it's, again, it is distinct from the sort of speeches that we might hear at a business meeting or an inspirational speech at a TED talk or or that sort of thing, and also distinct from lecturing, that this is uh, different than what we'd hear in a classroom. So anchoring it in the pulpit is a useful ceremony. Being vested, of course, is also a useful ceremony uh, that that helps the man disappear uh, behind the office with the hopes then that the words will come through clean of him and in fact be the, the Lord's words. The other thing in preaching that I think sometimes gets lost or confused that's a bit ceremonial, and that is that sermons are, for the most part, very formal speech. So we have often got this idea that the best sermons are just like conversations, and there might be a place for that, but I think for the most part, they're not. For the most part, the best sermons actually elevate speech. They're more like poetry than conversations. And I think that pastors are a little bit overly concerned about talking over the heads of their people. Uh, I, first of all, I think it's condescending. I think the lay people actually are a lot more theologically sophisticated than we give them credit for. Uh, and secondly, if they're not, how are they ever going to become more theologically sophisticated if we don't raise the bar and stretch them a little bit? 
So to have some formal speech that requires, again, effort on their part to listen to is a good thing. Uh, Luther talks in the large catechism very strictly about the duty of the hearers and how they're to attend the word and they're to listen and they're even supposed to remember it. Uh, So, you know, we all kind of joke about by the time you, you walk out of church, you forgot what the sermon was about. Luther would not think that's a joke, that the people actually have work to do in the sermon and they're supposed to curb their flesh and be attentive to it, and they're supposed to actually be contemplating these things and experiencing them. And if the pastor is joking and, you know, uh, that sort of thing, it's not really that helpful. Uh, It doesn't aid the sort of thing that really needs to be going on in a sermon. So there is a ceremonial aspect to this in that the sermon is not a break from the liturgy, that the sermon is a continuation. And it ought to have, for the most part, the same tone and the same, the same attitude. Uh, I don't mean to say that there's never any place at all for any sort of humor uh, or that there's no place for personal stories and anecdotes. Uh, I think these things can be used sparingly and, and with wisdom. Uh, but sometimes that becomes the bread and butter of our preaching rather than the uh, occasional embellishment or, or, or flavor so to, to recognize the sermon as part of the liturgy, uh, that, that the people stay during the sermon in the presence of God rather than you know, having a chance to sort of relax and be away from God and think about other things. So again, holding them accountable. They have their part to do. Even as they're supposed to know when to stand and when to sit and they're supposed to say their or sing their parts, they're also supposed to listen during the sermon. And we can aid them with that by giving them something to listen to and something to listen for, having actual doctrinal content. That's the other crazy thing that I hear sometimes, that people don't like doctrine. People love doctrine. Uh, Christians do. How could they not? Uh, So it's crazy to think that people don't want to know about the three genera or or those sorts of things. In fact, they do. And it's our job to teach them uh, and to use these opportunities for that purpose. After After the sermon comes... The, uh, in LSB, the offertory comes immediately, and then the offering. Uh, I think that is unfortunate. So I think it's much better to have the offertory attached to the service of the sacrament than as a response to the sermon. Uh, and of course, in our context, the offertory is pretty well sealed as Psalm 51, created me a clean heart. Uh, that is, created me a clean heart is really marvelous preparation for the sacrament of the altar and for the liturgy that that is coming. Um, And so that's what we do here. Here, the sermon is followed uh, by music on the organ, a musical offertory, and the collection of the offerings. The offerings should be part of worship. Uh, I I do not believe this. uh, Some people think that somehow that's of the law. I mean, I, I guess it's of the law, but who cares? So what if it's of the law? This is their part, and this is their duty, uh, and our duty, of course, as Christians as well, to support the church and the work of the church. And for it to be in the context of worship is most appropriate and good, uh, that they would actually bring their offerings as gifts to the Lord in response to the gospel so that the gospel might be preached and furthered in the world. Uh, So I think that this is, is a necessary component and a good part of worship. In fact, I'm not at all against offertory processions, that is, to, and we do them a few times a year here, that is where the bread and the wine are brought up to the altar at the same time as the money is brought up to the altar. And I think uh, it can be abused, and of course Luther doesn't like uh, the offertory processions because he's afraid people will get the idea that they are making the sacrament of the altar. Uh, And of course, obviously, no human being is making the sacrament of the altar. God does this through his word. But God does work through means. And in fact, the money that is brought every week uh, in the worship service is used to buy bread and wine for the sacrament of the altar. I mean, the bread and the wine, it's not the feeding of the 5,000. It doesn't come out of the thin air. It comes from the people's gifts. Uh, And I think it's actually good and helpful sometimes to be reminded of that and to recognize people that, look, God works through means, 
He works through you. This building doesn't maintain itself. This bread and wine doesn't come from nothing. The, the preaching of the gospel has to also be supported. The, wor- the workers worthy of his wages and all of that. So it's a significant part of worship, and it shouldn't be poo-pooed because it's, it, because it's part of the law. The people aren't doing it in self-righteousness. They're responding to the gospel, and they're doing it in love. And if they're doing it because they feel guilty, that's okay too, because the law also works as a curb. In any case, the, uh, uh, the offerings then, that's going to be handled probably, the actual ceremonies, are that is probably the place where we have more diversity than in anything else. Um, I would say that in the ideal world, the offerings ought to be received in some manner from the ushers or the elders, whoever brings them forward. And they ought to be somehow ceremonially acknowledged in front of the altar. Uh, Most ideally, though, they're not placed on the altar. Uh, Most ideally, they can be placed in the chancel on some sort of a credence table or or, or some other place. But I do think it's, it's worth what we do here is an acolyte gives the offering plates to the ushers. The ushers pass them down the aisle and then bring them up. The acolyte receives them. He comes back to the altar. He simply holds them up uh, to God, and then he takes them them over to their place. When the uh, exchange is happening between the ushers and whoever is giving them the plates and receiving them, uh, the person who's giving the plates or receiving them in the chancel should not bow to the people. So when the, when the ushers come up, they are bowing ceremonially to the altar, but I mean, they're not bowing to the altar, obviously, they're bowing to God. But in any case, they're not bowing to you or to the acolyte. So this isn't some sort of Chinese greeting. Don't, don't bow back. Uh, let them bow to God and just take what they're, what they're giving you. Uh, and then turn around, hold it up, and then place it where it belongs and, and continue. While then the offering is taking place, the key thing that's going to happen with a freestanding altar is that this is the best place to turn the altar around. Now, I say that it's the best place. What I mean is it is the best place in terms of the logistics and aesthetics of the service. Theologically, it'd be slightly better if we could wait until after the prayers. So if you waited until after the prayers, you could keep this sacramental, sacrificial uh, distinction in the liturgy slightly better. You know, because what's going to follow this what's going to, is going to be the offertory for us or the offering, and then the prayers of the church, and then the communion, the communion liturgy proper. So to offer the prayers from this side of the altar on behalf of the people, speaking as their ambassador to God, is most ideal. The problem with that is that then there's like nothing to sort of cover this logistical turning of the altar around. So for my part, it has seemed to me more prudent to do it at this point during the offering and and, and then to simply be facing the people for the prayers of the church. So we've got to basically, uh, to get this set up, all we really have to do is move the missile stand. Um, So the missile stand is going to be moved around to the opposite side, which will be the same side from the perspective of the pastor on his left. 